Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. I am a very foolish, fond old man, four score and upward, not an arm more or less. And to deal plainly, I fear I'm not in my perfect mind. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the program's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Christopher Plummer has written a fantastic memoir. And we have with us Mr. Plummer himself. Who brought along a sidekick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the one who brought him, so you're responsible for anything this man says, yes. Chris. Feasting with Panthers <laughs> comes to mind. Um, John Simon, the drama critic from Bloomberg News, a longtime uh, friend of this show. And John, uh, thank you for coming on. And I'm very thrilled to have Christopher Plummer, who is one of my favorite actors. Um, over the years, I've seen him do a great production, Barrymore, a uh, one-man show in mid-90s, I think, on Broadway. Was 97, something like that. That's one of the ones that sticks in my mind. Notice how actors remember the date to a T. <laughs> to, to a T, yes. exactly. It, well, you it said was actually you... December, they know. <laughs> and it you... ran 77,000 performances. <laughs> yeah, but right. you said you marked your life by counting the plays. Well, I did. It was yeah. the only way to, to, to remember incidents that occurred around them. And it was the easiest way to do it. Uh, because I thought, oh, my God, if it's going to be chronological, this, this is death. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, Henry V, my pubic hairs were shaved <laughs> because I had kidney stones that year. And then it starts, and the ball, and the ball. Know, it just it snowballs. It just, the memories come back. Well, like, yes, and yeah, you, you're, you have the most remarkable memory. <laughs> I don't know how Thank you. Uh, God. Yeah. <laughs> now, John, now, John um, you're, you you came with uh, Chris because you are a very very big fan of this book. Uh, in spite of myself, you have read uh, many uh, showbiz books, many uh, biographies of actors and artists. What is it about uh, this book that has impressed you so much? Well, in the first place, <clears throat> I think this is the best autobiography, although it modestly calls itself memoir. <clears throat> I've ever read of anything, certainly the best of film or theater that I've ever read, and I've read plenty. Mm -hmm. But it may even be the best of any kind. I think it is to memoir, I think, what Don Quixote is to fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> uh, now, why is, why is this? Because it's full of action, it's full of humor, it's full of profundity inside the humor, mm -hmm. because it is not only a great novel or a great uh, memoir, but one that's sort of omnivorous. He doesn't just talk about himself, he talks about every interesting person he met, and he gives them a chance to sound off. And he gives the funny anecdotes in their lives as as juicily as the ones in his life, which makes it a kind of theatrical or cinematic history beyond a mere bi autobiography, which is amazing. And this was your intention, right? The Don Quixote uh, was well, in Well, thanks, your John. I've got, to, I've got to go now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting point that he says, because you do read many actors' biographies, and it's always about themselves. But you have had a wonderful cast of people in your lives, well, and you I, do portraits yeah, of them that, in this. That was the the thing that Charlie Chaplin, uh, I think, wrote his own book, I can't remember, I think, mm -hmm. uh, the first part of which was marvelous about his youth and mm -hmm. growing up in poverty in London, and that was fascinating. But the minute he became successful, uh, it's boring, because success is boring. Mm -hmm. Failure is funny and <laughs> endearing. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, he, what do you say? You go on, and, and then I met this, and then I did that. So I whispered to his holiness. I mean, it's about <laughs> the only thing you can think. And I thought, no, one, if one's going to do this, we have got to avoid all that and write about other people. So write little short stories about other people that I've met, not necessarily all from my profession, no, no. But, I, but whom I have met and been fascinated with because of my profession, because of where it took me all over the, all over the globe. I also think, to, just to add a, um, an, a, another dimension to it, since you worked all over the world, there is a lovely uh, sort of travel log, if you will, a sort of a travel writing within this book as well. I mean, you feel that you're running around Marrakesh with you when you're making one of the Pink Panther movies, yes. Return of the Pink Panther. <laughs> yes, and you describe hotels well. 
Yeah. You know, I have a few. <laughs> and bars. You describe bars well, very even well. Hospitals. There's a, wonder, <laughs> there's a wonderful bit about yes. hospitals. I know really no other part of life but the bar, the, the hotel yes, lobby. Yes, you were in a hospital. lot of bars. <laughs> right? Yes. My favorite description was when you went to Russia to make the Battle of Waterloo. And. Yeah. and yeah. We were on this train. What do you remember the train? The Trans Siberian yes. Railway, yes. which by that time had lost all its former chic. Yes, <laughs> and uh, it took uh, it took us a, a day, I think, to get to Chop, which is the uh, border town in, in Hungary for the Soviet Union, and um, it was absolutely frightening because my first class cabin, which I was in my contract, ICM, yes. with my agent who had said first class compartment, yes. it had one goat in it <laughs> and three drunken Russian soldiers all asleep on a wooden bench with their shoe boots off and the stench from those boots. And down the hall where you wanted, if you wanted to pee, was this universal hole. <laughs> In full view of the rest of the train, you know, we, you, you, there was no door, and all the windows were locked. It, Did you fire your agent? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I certainly wanted to. But that was absolutely terrifying. And then, of course, when we arrived, to end the story, when we finally arrived in Chop, by making signs like, to the Russians, where is Chop? Because there was no brakeman to tell you what the next stop was. <laughs> Shot all these wild <laughs> gestures. Finally, they all thought we were totally mad from Mars. It suddenly, there it was, chop. So we got out. We were held at the border for almost a day because Jack Hawkins, mm. the actor, British actor whom I loved, yeah. great actor, had arrived with all he brought. He sort of, I'm going to stay in Russia. I'm going to bring all the pornography <laughs> I can. And he brought all these pornographic magazines, of course, the Russians. I'd never seen such things. <laughs> and the, the, the one immigration official started to read it, and of course everybody else wanted to read it. So, had, so we were detained. Until they'd all read it. Until they got to read it all. Oh my God, what a nightmare that whole movie. And it just begins there and goes on. Yeah, that's and a wonderful gets more disastrous as the. the, the and, and I was going to ask you, there's something that always has struck me about um, you, uh, your um, um, performances, but also your public personality when I see you interviewed and that kind of thing and in your writing too is he's an actor of taste a quality that many performers <laughs> lack I think Sean is, yes. that, is that a fair description of, oh, of the man absolutely absolutely uh, well I, sometimes I, I hate the word taste because it sort of puts a, a kind of mm, pin, pigeonholes you into a rather careful performer and I've never wanted to be careful uh, if I have any taste it's uh, not because of me, it's because of who I grew up with, perhaps, but I've always wanted to get rid of it so I could be a little bit freer, and and I've always been a bit jealous of those who don't give a damn whether they have taste or not, because really? taste, taste is good up to a point, but it also can be a killer. I mean, yes, I, I, so. I see what you're saying, because I mean, I always think of you as, a, as an elegant, polished performer. Do you, you feel that that constricts you in some way? Yes. You see, I wanted to be uh, like <laughs> all of New York oh, wow. actors, you know, <laughs> when I came here back in the early 50s. <laughs> and uh, I was dying to be those kind of creatures, and they always put me in these elegant, sort of boring parts. And I, <laughs> y you grew up uh, in a, you grew up an elegant, uh, elegant uh, uh, milieu in, in Canada. Yes, somebody recently said it was interesting in what you said about upper crust Canada, and then he puts in brackets, whoever thought there was an upper crust Canada? <laughs> and, uh, Must be cold. <laughs> and I, I rather loved him for that. The, the, the reason I wrote, wrote about it is because nobody really knows that at one point Montreal was a very elegant, yeah. stylish city yeah. that had more nightclubs than there were days of the year. That had the best cabaret that was open 24 hours a day. So jaded New Yorkers who, were, who wanted a drink during Prohibition came across the border. <laughs> Montreal was the lively town mm. in North America. And terrific but, food, too. But yeah, your, your well, grandparents were quite wealthy and then lost their money. Yes, so I saw the, the destruction of our of mm -hmm. the, the of the disintegration wealth. of all the sort of style that I, that I felt I was accustomed to. The structure of your book is that you've written about your terribly influential mother, who was a single parent, correct? Yeah. Yes. And and then the end of the first section of your book is the death of your mother. That and and you talk about that in your grief you were freed artistically. Yes. I, yes. I, I say that it, it's true. 
um, I think I was so angry the day of her funeral because the, I watched the new minister who had taken over from our old family minister that I knew, and I saw him suddenly look at his watch mm. during the service, mm. and then, bang, it all stopped, and I suddenly had had it, and I wanted just to go away. So I, so I put it in the book that I'd suddenly found the anger for which I'd been looking for all those years. Mm -hmm. The anger that, of course, by that I means the anger that an artist mm -hmm. must possess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which then, to I guess, come. leads to the drive, the ambition, the will to That's right. break That's through. Right. And also the great temper, which I think is a very important thing in the theater. I wish I, I'm working on it. I wish I still had it, but, uh, or I could get it. But I think it's very important if you're going to play the great classic roles, even if it's Hamlet, you must possess a great temper. It was James Eggert who, Eggert, Eggert who was always saying that, the, the, the English critic, and he was right. Mm. And you can't play Romeo unless you can terrify the audience when he, when he gets angry and grabs Farrell Lawrence and takes the, the potion. He'll yeah. do anything, he'll go wild, but the audience has to feel, my God. When you say you wish you could get that temper back. I've always, uh, no, I've always, I'm getting better at that temper and I think I have it, but I just wish it was I always try to make it bigger at everything well, I When do. we last saw you here in, in Inherit the Wind, and you still had a tremendous mm. force. Well, yeah, I that was last year. In that play. Well, force I'm not talking about. Well, I'm talking about um, the great temper which can frighten an audience. There's a good, very, very good passage about that in your book, a paragraph which at some point I'd like to read. You can read it right now. Right now? Well, keep talking because I shall have to I, find Shall it. I find the page for you? <laughs> well, also, but, but in, in, terms, in terms of the structure of your book, though, I think because, because with that anger, you went out and you had a wild time. I mean, yeah. you, not only were you acting all the time and building this distinguished career, but also you, uh, it's, it's amazing you're alive how much you drank and you had because it seemed like zillions of women I lost count and then and then comes at the, the end of at the beginning of the third, third section of your book you meet your wife yes and that's a whole new no, world well, for you to such an honor. yes lovely yeah. lady yeah. lovely lady well yes she and was, it becomes a love story yeah it finally does yes it finally does and it's true I mean, we, we still fight, of course, like well, mad, but then who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it, uh, that's true. That's not, there's nothing sentimental about that. I, uh, that's absolutely true. No, it's a lovely... She, she knows too, too much about me. Uh, I could never leave her now. <laughs> yes, she, no, anyway. you, you've got a passage about this yeah, issue of this temper. Point. This is about Olivier, about whom he's brilliant, because yeah. he admires him, but he also sees what's the flaws, not quite yeah. so good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this is general. All great actors have it in them to overwhelm. They make dead sure that they are at odds with everything that is happening around them, that whatever they do is unexpected and unsettling, that they know the trick of the light in the eye, the delayed entrance, the sudden dazzling vocal speed, the unearthly voice from the past, the instinct for milking poetry, the temper of Zeus, the stillness that silences, and that unexplainable thing called pathos. Mm. Now that's great. Very well put. And none you, you said none he of which I own. <laughs> 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 well, let me ask you, though. You saw this in Olivier, and then how do you, as a younger actor studying that, how can you absorb and take from what he's doing to uh, uh, enhance your own art artistry? Oh, How did you do it, that? Oh, no, no, that's very, that's very easy. You, yeah. don't, you don't imitate. Mm -hmm. You must never imitate. Because when you're young, of course, you do imitate. And I'm guilty. I imitate. I, I'm quite a good mimic, so it's easy for me to imitate people, which you must not do mm -hmm. in, the, in the theater. That's cheap, and it's not done, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what, what, you, what you see in front of you when it happens is, is very easy, and it sort of pleases you because there's, there's a kind of arrogance about it that is a necessary arrogance. It isn't, um, it isn't conceit. Mm. It's proper arrogance. You must be, be able to be, think yourself better for, for, for a second mm. than anyone in the room. It's a horrible thing to say, 
but it's important that you feel that, as long as you don't carry it on into life. <laughs> I enjoyed carrying it on into life. <laughs> <Yes>. You were <have> a <laughs> reputation for being a little difficult. I, I got sort of slugged because of it. <laughs> well, but why would they pay to see you if you didn't happen? <coughs> but you felt that Olivier lacked something. There was one well, thing Well, the one said, thing he, yes. he lacks, in my, and that thing, which is, uh, forgive me, because I think he's, of course, yes, he's no, a great but, actor, uh, was pathos. Yeah. Because pathos you have to be born with. And, uh, and I, I don't have it either. Uh, Ralph Richardson had it. Yeah. In, uh, Marlon had it yeah. on the screen. I, I didn't. I never saw Marlon on the stage, but on the screen. How would you it. define that for an actor? Pathos. Pathos. Yes. A sort of kind of autumnal vulnerability that just you don't have to. It's like the beginning and the end of one's life all at once. I see. I felt you had that in the King Lear that I know we disagree on. I thought his King Lear had... Well, had, I, had, had, to, had, I had, had to act pathos, uh, and, and you can do it, as Larry Olivier does. You see, he's his technique was such that he smoke-screened you into <laughs> believing that he had pathos, and he was brilliant at it, and that's... Uh, that is my, now, he, for instance, he borrowed lots of stuff from other actors. Yeah. He borrowed the keen... When you watch Hamlet, the movie, that wonderful scene where he's berating Ophelia in mm -hmm. the chapel to a nunnery go, and she breaks down, and he goes off. This is exactly what Edmund Keen did two, two centuries before. He goes off, sees her crying, comes back, and without her knowing, he, he takes the strand of her hair and kisses it and leaves. Wonderful. And the pouse, of course, goes, must have gone nuts. <laughs> well, I thought that you had this this arrogance, you will, in, in that great performance uh, of Barrymore. Oh, that, God. That yeah. you did. I mean, yeah. that was, you, yeah. you made me uh, feel that I was seeing the great kind of 19th century, early 20th century stage mm -hmm. actor who basically said, I am here and everybody else is <laughs> over there. Well, that's <laughs> right. I'm glad. That's what I intended to do. All right, let's get cracking. You probably hadn't noticed, but I tend to stagger. My whole family staggers. I come from a long line of staggerers. My father, God rest his soul, was a great staggerer. Staggering is a sign of strength, Jackie, he would say. Only the weak have to be carried home. My highest compliment is I never looked at my program once through the whole performance. <laughs> uh, is that what you do? <laughs> That's an, an actor for whom you had great affection was Jason Robards, oh, Jr. Yes, did yes. he have pathos? Yes, I think he did. He, I think he absolutely did. I think when I first saw him in, uh, I describe it in the book uh, as uh, Hickey in The Iceman Cometh yeah. at uh, Circle in the Square. He was quite young. He just got out of the Navy. <clears throat> and this is a bit second or third stage performance he had done in New York and he, he made me forget I was in the theater you know I, I, I love those moments of people who to do that I forget I was sitting there mm. I was transported and he was able to put everything on and shout and scream and laugh and cry all at the same time in that famous long speech at the end of the play yeah. and that certainly was pathos he had a huge vulnerability Jason in his personal uh, life, both in it his life, too. and uh, yeah, and women used to just crowd around him simply because he had gave that great hangdog look of his, and, <laughs> and said, "Oh, please hold my hand. I'm in such trouble." Yes. That's what was written all over his face, and of course they flocked to him. They wanted to, Amazing. they wanted to convert him Amazing. into what they didn't know, but they wanted to. They wanted to him. save him. Yeah, maybe save yeah. him. And yeah. how did he change then? You did no man's land with him, yes. correct? And yeah. how was he changed then at the end of no, his life? No, he didn't change very yeah. much. No, he. He, he still wasn't drinking had, at the end of his life. No, he had the odd glass of wine, but he wasn't drinking to the extent that we all had been drinking. Yeah. Um, he, he didn't change. He always had yeah. that uh, great bonhomie and humor, even though he'd had that horrendous oh. accident. Mm. His whole face was, was re, redone, and the jaw was redone. He still braved it through with the same personality. It hadn't diminished at all. Yeah. I'm curious about this notion of, um, <clears throat> of, of, of drinking in the theater, and actors drinking, because I know many actors now, and they, they, you know, they drink to some extent. But I never no, get the sense drinking that drinking is out now. That's what I was. Yeah. Saying. I don't get the sense that they drank the way a friend of mine and yours, Brian Dennehy, uh, you oh, know, hi. could drink. How was it that you guys 
could do that. Could you do it before the show, or was it just after the show? Well, sometimes or? it was even during. <laughs> <laughs> really? Did you no, ever keep The on? whole thing was, it was fun because, in particularly English thing too, in, in the English theater, if you didn't deliver a terrific performance of Hamlet on the matinee after following a huge night out without sleep, mm. you were either hungover or still drunk. And if you got through Hamlet, you were a man, my son. Yeah. And that was, that was that was the sort of challenge of okay, I'll show you that I can be a good two-fisted drinker and still and do hamlet. Still do hamlet. Don't you think there are a lot of actors around today who would profit by drinking? <laughs> Probably, yeah. yes. I, I think it gave us our, some of our sense of humor. Uh, yes, As I yes. keep telling my my wife. And she, and she keeps reminding me how really unattractive I was when I drank. I said, well, thank you, darling. Well, there comes a moment in one's life and indeed one's career. Did you have a sense when you just can't be the, the young Hamlet who was hung over anymore? I mean, just physically, technically. Oh, yes, sense. I can. <laughs> What's in that mug? <laughs> That's right. Doesn't there come a sense, though, a time in your career where you think, if yes, I go down this route, I'm just not going to be able to keep oh, a performance Oh, of course, I couldn't together. possibly do what I just did, Caesar and Cleopatra. I couldn't play Caesar now. There's a huge role by Shaw. I mean, and, and keep the, the wit going and the little quick riposts. And how could you do that when you just sort of come on like a duck? Impossible. Sadly, though, I miss those wonderful days. <laughs> yeah. John, I want to, um, uh, we only have a minute uh, left, I'm afraid, but you saw uh, Chris's uh, Caesar, Caesar and Cleopatra, which is coming to New York, we hope. We hope. hope. Yes, we hope. Yes. Uh, and I know, speaking to you, you raved about it. What was so special about his performance? And overall, what is so special about him as an actor? Well, there, I, I, at the risk of being narcissistic. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> But there's something in, in the galleys for his book that is not in the final book, and that not because of me, but because of him should have been somewhere. What are the prerequisites for a great Shakespearean actor? First, a beautiful voice that also knows how to wrap itself around poetry, a musical instrument of considerable range, which its owner can expertly manipulate. Second, versatility. Third, good or at least distinctive looks that have a certain adaptability. Fourth, intelligence, a full intellectual as well as emotional grasp of the text. Fifth, that mysterious thing called charisma. Christopher Plummer has all of those qualities in spades. This was your review? That's what, no, this, this is from my review of Barrymore. You are quoted several times in this book. Wow. But that, that must have been about John Gilgan, I think. No, <laughs> no, no, I don't think no. so. I don't think so. Um, yes, well, I, I think that's it. And, and another thing, too, I want to just bring out, uh, I was thinking about you know, reading the book because you have lots of stories of movies and doing that kind of thing. There were a number of actors of your generation who I think could have been great stage actors who got caught up in making movies and making lots of money yes, and going know, that route. It's rather nice that they did because it left more room for <laughs> us who stayed behind. I mean, Marlon Brando, who had everything yeah. uh, that John has just talked about in that. Had he worked on it, had he, had he kept coming back to the theater and then going off again, and he could have been the most extraordinary classical actor. He had an ear, he had all those things, as well as the, a great contemporary force. Mm -hmm. force. Uh, but he didn't. He, he chose, had too he much chose, pathos, yeah. He chose to yeah. stay in Hollywood because I think, he, I think good old Marlon, despite his greatness, uh, was lazy. Yeah. And didn't want to come back to the boring old theater and do it night after night. But thank God he stayed out there. <laughs> Don't come back, Marlon. Please leave some room you, for us. And you always wanted to, because you could have had the movie. I mean, you had a huge movie career. You could have, you could have, you know, stayed by the kidney shaped pool in Hollywood and mm. raked it in all the time. Why, why keep coming back to put yourself through oh, no. facing that, the John Simons of the world? Just one answer to that, and that's because, <laughs> in spite of yourself. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing that replaces the, uh, the live reaction from an audience. There's nothing in the world mm. like the sound of laughter or the silence that follows it. You know. mm. uh, Wonderful. Plus, you bought a haunted house in Hollywood, but you have to buy the book to read about that. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called A Wonderful Memoir uh, in Spite of Myself by Christopher Plummer. Delighted that you uh, were on, uh, our, on the show tonight. Thank you so much. And John Simon, it's always a pleasure to see you, and thank yeah. you for reading thank so you. eloquently and describing mm -hmm. his work so well. My, God. My pleasure. My sure. privilege. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. How did they go about all this... Uh, Begatting. What do you mean? Well, I mean, did uh, people begat in those days 
about the same way they get themselves begat today? The process is about the same. I don't think your scientists have improved it any. <laughs> in other words, uh, these folks were conceived and brought forth through the normal biological function known as sex. What do you think of sex, Colonel Brady? In what spirit is this question asked? Well, I'm not asking you what you think of sex as a, a husband or a father or a presidential candidate. I mean, you're up here as an expert on the Bible. What is the biblical evaluation of sex? It is considered original sin. And all these holy people got themselves begat through original sin. Oh. 